Good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. I uh, got a lecture on tap for you on globalization, information, and culture. So the second of our two uh, lectures on globalization today. Just a couple of quick things to mention before we get started uh, in terms of the syllabus and what's coming up. The first is that on Thursday, what I'm going to have you guys do is um, I'm going to put up in the discussion um, section, I'm going to have a link to the TED Talk that we were going to watch and discuss together. And I'm just going to post some questions about that so you can respond to those in the discussion section. And then what I'll be recording instead of the normal lecture uh, or a normal lecture on Thursday is I'll be recording um, the guidelines on how to write the book critique. So I will um, be posting the, the one page sheet uh, in the file section and then I will record what I normally do in class. So it's probably going to be, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes, something like that, going over the sheet um, with pitfalls, et cetera, stuff for you guys to avoid. Uh, so that's uh, Thursday. A week from today, uh, we will be having our last lecture, which is on uh, sort of development issues. And then starting uh, Thursday, the 16th of April, we will be discussing the Brooks and Wolforth books. And now is the last reminder. Um, I shouldn't say that because I'm sure I'll remind you again on Thursday. But uh, another reminder to get the Brooks and Wolforth book if you haven't already done so. Okay. Uh, so all that said, what are we going to talk about today? Well, uh, first of all, just a reminder from last time that what we said globalization was, was these unprecedented high flows of trade, money, and information around the world, right? So we're at this moment in human history where those, those flows are really unprecedented. Um, and on uh, Thursday last week, we talked about the trade part of that equation. Today, we're going to talk about the information flows and then the kind of cultural exchange that happens as a consequence of that. So the first thing I'm going to talk about in terms of this lecture today is uh, the information flow question relative to state sovereignty and whether inf information flows are eroding state sovereignty or not. Then we're going to talk a little bit, kind of a little mini discussion about cybersecurity because it's relevant to uh, global um, information flows. And then finally, we're going to have a little preliminary discussion on globalization and culture. And then, um, as you will have seen from the syllabus, you were supposed to read uh, two selections from the uh, Mingston Snyder Essentials reading, one on um, uh, one by Samuel Huntington and one by Rudolph and Rudolph. And so um, be a little bit shorter today because you're going to be discussing that uh, in the discussion section as well. And those questions are already posted. OK. So big question here when we talk about um, globalization and information is whether, in fact, what we're seeing, this is the big question for this section of the, of the lecture, is whether with the rise of global information um, sharing and the, the movement of information across borders in an unprecedented way, whether that is leading to the erosion of state sovereignty, whether that's leading um, to governments uh, facing limits on their on their authority. So um, first thing to say, of course, you know, this is the reality that you guys overwhelmingly are just used to as a natural thing. But the first thing to note is that um, technological, the technological advances of the information technology revolution um, are basically they lead to or they, they constitute a prerequisite to this shift to global information sharing. Um, they allow it to happen, but they don't necessarily make it uh, inevitable, right? That governments have to make choices about what they allow and governments do make choices about what they do and don't allow. Um, so that's the critical uh, thing to think about. So in terms of those who argue that there is really an erosion of sovereignty. They really um, say kind of two basic things. First, that citizens of states can increasingly question 
use outside information um, about some aspect of what's happening within their government, um, within their state, to use that to criticize their state, right? So they get information from outside news sources or um, maybe through information sharing, they get uh, information from human rights groups or other NGOs, maybe environmental NGOs, right? About the level, let's say the level of pollution, and then they can use that to go out and criticize their government. The second thing that happens with information flows is of course they don't just go in, but they can go out as well. And citizens can disseminate information that they learn, that they gather, right? Let's say they take, you know, pictures of human rights abuses, for example, they can then share the, that um, information abroad. Now, so both of those things sort of suggest that governments would be facing um, limits on their sovereignty as their citizens are able to access information from abroad that they might not have allowed historically. And then second of all, that citizens, their citizens can disseminate information that the government might not want them to, and they can share that abroad. So that's kind of this, the, the initial story, and maybe the story that is most common, the story that most of you would have heard. And in fact, if you think about like kind of the early days of Facebook or um, some of the other social media sites, there was this kind of promise that uh, the information technology revolution was going to lead to more democracy. It was going to lead to um, better, you know, human rights situations and better um, uh, situations for the lives of the people around the world. Well, instead, um, there's a flip side to this, which is that governments can and do fight back against the erosion of sovereignty. Um, and they do so by controlling the flow of information in different ways. They, in other words, the, the existence of the internet does not mean that everyone has equal access to information, um, that governments play a big role in the mediation of that. Um, process and the information flows. Um, so China, for example, and some of you uh, will know this already, but um, others may not. Um, the, the internet service providers in China are government uh, affiliated. And so the governments can use the control of those internet service providers to control the information that flows through. Um, it can also and does uh, have um, uh, uh, either specific deals or rules, whatever, but with specific companies as to, um, you know, the, the kind of content that they will allow if the Chinese government will allow if those um, providers want to have access to the Chinese market, right? So the, the average Chinese citizen, when they engage in the internet, for example, they wouldn't come into contact with information about the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre, this kind of blight on China's reputation, um, because China, the Chinese government, the Chinese Communist Party has sanitized it from the internet. Now, um, that is not to say uh, that um, Chinese citizens have no access to external information. This, the citizens who are sophisticated and have the resources um, are able to um, access the external kind of broader a uh, more complete internet through um, uh, VPNs, through uh, virtual private networks um, and other means, but this is not, <laughs> look at that. Um, this is not what most um, Chinese, most Chinese citizens, just um, the extent to which they have access and, 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 and are um, able from a financial perspective to access the internet, they, um, would just be consuming the, the version of the internet that the Chinese government wants them to. Second thing that governments can do is not only do they control the, the, the access of kind of digital information, but they actually play a role in the dissemination packaging of information themselves, not just internally, but externally, right? So um, some of you will have heard of RT, Russia Times, um, lots of governments have an active organ of their state that is funded by the state with the explicit purpose of essentially presenting their government's perspective um, to the world, to external actors, right? The United States doesn't have that. Even other actors that have, like, so Britain has a very, um, as you guys um, have probably heard of the BBC, you know, very well respected, but the BBC is not 
seen as the official organ of the British government. It's not there to spread pro-British propaganda. And in fact, um, some British government officials are, you know, almost always are frustrated with the BBC's criticism, right? Um, so governments can, can disseminate information. Governments also, and this is um, something that really, so we talked about the Arab Spring in class. And um, if you, you may or may not recall this, but when I talked briefly about Tunisia, uh, at the start of the Arab Spring in Tunisia was a case where social media, a lot of the activists used social media to organize their protests, to organize their their struggle against um, the uh, the Tunisian government. And it caught the government off guard. And, you know, in, in very um, short order, the government was sort of overwhelmed by the protests and fell. Well, in the Syria case, which happened, you know, not didn't start so much later than, um, but, but did happen a little bit later. Um, the Assad regime was much more capable of, um, learning maybe from that initial experience and they were more sophisticated. And so they used social media actually to track, um, the, the protest movement and in many cases to arrest, um, jail, torture dissidents, right? They would use social media as a trap, as a, um, a form of evidence that they would uh, then um, use against the the participants in dissent and um, and ultimately bring um, you know bring the state's resources to bear through social media um, as a tool of you know of control. Uh, finally, um, just because the citizens of a particular state are sharing information, about how bad things are with the outside world just because they're getting information from the outside world about how bad things are doesn't mean that governments are going to fall right there are plenty of governments out there that are that are resilient in the uh in the face of low level discontent or even maybe medium level discontent as long as people aren't capable of gaining the levers of power which in many instances means control of the military um governments that are um, determined can often withstand a lot. Okay, so giving you maybe a little bit more of a nuanced picture, I mean, my my view tends to be that maybe glo um, the globalization of information has kind of affected things around the margins, that for the most part, um, the, the, the picture is one where governments have retained you know, most of their sovereign, most governments have retained most of their sovereignty. Oops. Okay, switching now to a little bit of a discussion of cybersecurity. So um, how is this related, you might be thinking? Well, um, cybersecurity and um, cyber conflict are really a consequence of internet information technology globalization and the global flows of information. Right. Um, so the Internet um, was designed to make information flows easy and uh, right. That's sort of the basic kind of initial starting concept. But in so doing, it means that those systems are very vulnerable. In fact, people say that in the cyber realm, um, the offense has a, an advantage over the defense because for offensive moves for attacks to work, all they have to do is find one little vulnerability in these incredibly complex systems of software or whatever the case might be, right? Um, so, and that's what hackers are constantly probing. They're looking for that one vulnerability, these so-called zero day vulnerabilities that are, um, that are something that is innate, built into the package when it's created, that um, software designers miss, um, and then, they can use those vulnerabilities, one little vulnerability, one little corner, one little angle to get in and then cause and then achieve their objectives, whatever those are. Uh, so that leads me to the next point, which is that um, you hear the word cyber, cybersecurity, cyber warfare thrown around a lot. Um, and the first and most important thing to say here is that you've got a real, real array of different kinds of attacks. So um, Cyber crime is overwhelmingly the most common and, and um, both, you know, things, simple things like phishing attempts against individuals, 
that are used to gain control of either informa individual information that is sold um, or uh, cybercrime that's used to get um, control of, let's say, a bank account or credit card information, right? Um, cybercrime that is also used against companies. So either, uh, uh, you know, one company may be spying on another and using using cyber um, cyber crime that way, um, hacking into uh, employee information, right? Um, and then there's cyber espionage, which will take to mean spying on governments. Now that can be done by non-state actors. Um, it's obviously a little bit different um, than the sort of WikiLeaks type scenario, which is more generally more seen as hacktivism, although certainly been allegations of government involvement um, there, but cyber espionage being, you know, and sometimes what we see with cyber espionage is it's, you know, uh, actors affiliated with, let's say, the Chinese government spying on the United States. That's very straightforward. But in other cases, it could be for hire. It could be, um, and that's, um, by the way, something to mention here is that the people talk about in this field, um, cybersecurity can be at least uh, so-called weapon of the week, because governments that are not super powerful, like North Korea, can put, you know, a fair amount of resources into this. And while, you know, what they can't do with those kinds of resources is develop, you know, a aircraft carrier, they can develop a pretty robust cyber capacity, either by training their citizens or by hiring um, uh, others abroad some combination of the two, um, maybe cooperation, coordination with other actors, right? So um, that's uh, a little bit about the weapon of the week. So cyber crime, cyber espionage are two big ones. And then the third um, most common, the thing that you see the most is what are so-called nuisance attacks. So these are um, like DDoS, direct denial of service uh, attacks on, you know, big government web pages. So like, you know, uh, early in this um, process of discussing cybersecurity, it would be like, oh, you know, these cyber hackers have uh, immobilized the CIA's public web page. It's like, well, what real effect does that actually have on the real world? Because the CIA's public web page is used by my, you know, college students who want to look at the CIA fact book. And so, yeah, their research is thrown off for a few hours, but um, now, it is different if it's a government website that is used for, you know, let's say, I don't know, Social Security or something that people are using um, actively as part of, uh, you know, um, uh, their daily lives and they're, they're unable to access some sort of information or get process benefits or something like that. That is a much more serious um, uh, offense. But if it's just something like, you know, a web page that's mostly used for kind of you know, public image, and that's not accessible for a few hours, it's not such a big deal, right? So those three kinds of activities are really the most common. Now, um, what we call cyber, so there's a bit of a debate on cyber warfare. Um, two things that people talk about, and kind of you probably think of this as a spectrum, right? Um, but two things people talk about when they talk about cyber warfare are having real world physical consequences. So it's one thing to take down a website. It's another thing if, you know, uh, planes fall out of the sky, right? Which would be pretty extreme. Um, but if you can do a cyber attack that makes planes fall out of the sky, that would be real consequences. Attacks on infrastructure, right? Um, shutting down a water plant or something like that. That would be, and then the, so the first thing is real world consequences. And then the, the more extreme, um, thing that people talk about when they talk about cyber warfare is people actually dying. So if there are actual deaths, uh, some people are going to argue that's the threshold that you should have when you call something cyber warfare. Um, and then I guess I'll just mention one more uh, is people talk about the use of cyber in conjunction with kinetic or kind of regular use of force, right? Airstrike, something like that. But if you like shut down a, a country's power grid at the same time as you're bombing them, for kind of psychological, maximum psychological uh, consequences. Uh, people talk about that as well. Um, but the bottom line is that um, cyber warfare with any kind of physical effects is very rare and it's very difficult to pull off. Um, so perfect example is the US-Israeli 
cooperate, um, cooperation um, on what was called uh, Olympic Games to produce this um, worm called Stuxnet that uh, basically what it did was it infected the Iranian computer system for controlling centrifuges, right, for as part of their nuclear um, nuclear program. And it's like subtly, as in like, you know, a couple percentage points would speed up and slow down the centrifuges as a way of essentially wearing down the system um, with the idea that it was supposed to be so subtle that it wouldn't get picked up, but it would have real effects. And I believe the estimates are that it set their program back like, somewhere between three and five years before it was detected in 2010. Uh, and uh, the Iranians were capable of, of uh, removing it. Um, but the point being that what you see the most common, the cyber crime, cyber espionage, and these nuisance attacks, um, those are easier to do. Um, the, the ones with real physical consequences are a lot harder to do, and they've been, they've been rarer. Okay, last thing to talk about real quickly here, and normally this is we spend a lot of time in class on this because it's a lot of fun. We do a lot of back and forth, um, but you'll have to fill in the gaps based on your own experiences here. Um, so the first thing just to note is we've been talking about information, right? So, you know, like I said, information like, uh, you know, what's the level of pollution in Beijing, right? Um, now what we're talking about is the fact that that this sharing of, of information, the ease with which we can share information, also at least allows for the possibility of cultural sharing as well. So what does that mean? Uh, what it means is that, um, well, there is some debate about what it means, but um, because cultural flows are easier, um, some would argue that we're moving in the direction of kind of a global culture, a universal culture and, and cultural differences are just decreasing more broadly. Um, and that, you know, even some would argue, and I think this is a pretty, you know, minority point, but it's out there, so I, you should note it, um, that, you know, kind of having a global shared culture would be some basis for global citizenship, the end of the nation state, et cetera. Um, at a minimum, though, some would argue that knowing more about others and their cultures is gonna make us more tolerant. Um, certainly, that's not the only thing that can happen. Um, on the other hand, sometimes knowing more about others makes you, makes some at least um, feel threatened and lash out or develop a sense of superiority, right? Um, all right. So cultural knowledge can lead to racism, et cetera. Um, just noting those at the beginning. And then the real question um, in the second part of what I wanted to say here is what we've seen mostly as um, is not just the the fair sharing of culture, but American pop culture, um, by which I mean music, uh, movies, right, food, dress, um, Amer those elements of culture. And some people would call these low culture, right, not high culture like you know, art or um, things of the same things of that nature, um, but that uh, this is what what is really emerging. Some would argue is sort of American cultural hegemony. So the people around the world, rather than you know people in Mexico now understanding more about South Korea, it's people in Mexico and South Korea both becoming more American in their culture. So that's the question: Is that in fact the case? Now, if we were in class, I would say, you know, those of you who have studied abroad, lived abroad, excuse me, um, for any period of time, you know, what's been your experience? Do you see more, um, do you see American culture in places that you wouldn't expect it? Do you see the erosion of local cultures? Um, or do you see cultural resilience? Do you see, you know, pushback? Um, and so I've got some ideas up here listed as kind of an assimilation approach or assimilationist approach where you sort of essentially take on. Uh, a little bit of a joke there with, uh, I don't know if we've got anybody, any Canadian background, but it's, it's sort of my take on most of Canada, certainly not um, uh, Quebec, but the rest of Canada seems very uh, U.S. light, um, you know, uh, in, in a cultural sense. You've then got some who take on a sort of rejectionist approach. So I was France there. Now, of course, um, 
anybody who's been to France will know that they also love their hamburger joints. Um, and um, so it's, it's, it's hard to take it terribly seriously. They also look um, a lot more, I would say today, if you, um, if you, if you went back to essentially the first time that I went to Europe in the early nineties um, and looked at what people, how people dressed then, it's a lot closer to the United States today, right? Um, and then, of course, there are instances out there where there's sort of an explicit uh, rejection of things American. So I put Iran as an example, but there are plenty of other um, uh, cases of this as well. Now, one of the things that comes out when I do talk with the entire class, because some of you will say, like, I don't have any experience uh, outside of the United States. Um, one of the things that comes out when we have these conversations is people who've traveled to capital cities in most countries, those are the places where you expect the most American culture um, to, to be present. And if you spend time in some small village, uh, it tends to be less the case. Um, the other is kind of, you know, what are sort of the, you know, the, the, the really important cultural traditions, those tend to stick. Um, most places around the world, um, while the day to day may be, you know, wearing a hoodie and, um, uh, you know, listening to American music. Um, so kind of just some thoughts there in terms of, of, uh, what's happening with globalization and culture. Again, um, sadly, we can't have the, the broader conversation because I always benefit from hearing what students, uh, their experiences with globalization and culture, although feel free, um, as you might have seen, there aren't a lot of, you know, comments on my, uh, on my lecture. So feel free to throw in something if you've got something, um, uh, from your own travels that you want to share in terms of whether you see more of an American cultural hegemony or more, um, more reaction to that, more uh, resilience of local cultures. Uh, and like I said, uh, one uh, thing to just say as we're closing is a, a reminder that there is the, I posted the discussion questions on the Huntington um, and Rudolph versus Rudolph debate uh, from the, the Mason Snyder reader. And a reminder that, um, as I said last time, those things will be uh, fair game for the, for the final exam, which means that there will be at least a couple of questions. The ones that, particularly the ones that are starred um, for discussion, uh, you can guarantee that there will be at least a few questions on each of those. Okay, have a great day, and I'll see you guys, or you'll see me, rather, on Thursday.